Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. My name is Matt and thanks so much for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please like, subscribe, or leave me a comment. Today we're going to talk about Global Blood Therapeutics. It was a recommendation in the YouTube comments and I think I can provide some value here, so I thought I'd do a video on it. So we're going to talk about sickle cell disease, then get into the company and do a quick portfolio wrap up. All right, so sickle cell disease itself is a, uh, it's really just a mutation in the hemoglobin gene. And uh, so normally, for those who don't know, uh, red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body. They pick it up from the lungs and deliver it to tissues, all because they have this hemoglobin gene that has high affinity binding uh, to oxygen. So that's uh, normally the, the dogma. These red blood cells, they drop off the oxygen and then go back to the lungs and pick it up. If you have the mutation, though, the sickle mutation, what happens after the oxygen is delivered is... The, they become dehydrated, and they're more likely to polymerize. So what happens is you get these uh, sticky red blood cells that will adhere to the endothelial wall, or they'll um, all bind and clump up together. And uh, this actually has very negative effects for a bunch for almost every organ in the body, as well as these uh, vasoocclusive um, events that can be very painful and can last for quite a while. So. Uh, a lot of companies have been trying to come up with treatments for this because the current standard of care really isn't able to meet uh, the needs entirely of patients. So if we go through a bit of their documentation here, uh, we can see like almost all of the organs that are affected by uh, sickle cell disease. The burden is about $200,000 per patient, which is uh, pretty substantial per year. And they end up with a two to three decade reduction in life expectancy. So uh, yeah, so it's good that there's companies out there trying to to fix this, but um, it's uh, there's still some some road ahead I think that needs to happen. So, uh, Voxelator is the product that Global Blood Therapeutics offers, and it's a once oral uh, daily therapy, and it's basically able to stop the hemoglobin polymerization from happening. So it binds and then uh, prevents these he these mutated hemoglobin. Uh, monomers to clump up together so that uh, you don't get these negative effects that that I just mentioned. So the two things that uh, people usually look for when they're dealing with treatments associated with sickle cell disease is increasing hemoglobin because what happens when you get a lot of this polymerization is you get hemolysis of the red blood cells which just means that the red blood cells burst and uh, you get a overall decrease in hemoglobin concentration in the blood. So this is measurable, and uh, if you measure this and you treat sickle cell disease, you should expect hemoglobin levels to rise. The other thing that people are looking at is the amount of vaso-occlusive events, and uh, this has been kind of a controversial endpoint because it's hard to measure. Uh, some studies in the past used hospitalizations due to uh, vaso-occlusive crises, but this isn't really valid because you could have like debilitating pain, but just not go to the hospital necessarily. So uh, it's been a cause for concern and Global Blood actually came up with their own system to measure vaso-occlusive crises and it was uh, allowable under the FDA. So uh, to get into a bit of the data, you know, you can go through the phase one study and um, they, they show that it actually improves hemoglobin, which is good. So they look at the uh, number of patients who get more than one gram per deciliter increase in hemoglobin after treatment. And uh, you can see here, this is a phase one study, but I'm actually just gonna go to the HOPE study, which is their latest phase three study. And what they did here is they did two different doses of Oxalator, 1500 and 900 milligrams, and treated for three months. So the preliminary data that they saw here was that uh, almost 60% of patients on the high dose got an increase of uh, in hemoglobin from baseline of over one. So they met their primary objective as of this. Now, the, the issue is that they didn't really see a significant change in the vaso-occlusive crises, which is something that is relatively controversial. And uh, so they say here numerically fewer VOC episodes, but they didn't give like any sort of p-value. They didn't talk about uh, whether or not, like what's going on with their new method of looking at vaso-occlusive crises. So people are, and rightfully so, kind of concerned about this because 
uh, a lot of trials in the past have actually gone through and, and been able to see an improvement in hemoglobin, but they haven't seen an improvement in vasoocclusive crises, and this led to uh, non-approval by the FDA. So what Global Blood has done is after they collected this data, uh, they said, you know what, let's just see if the FDA can will give us accelerated approval for this, and uh, then they'll complete the study, but they'll be able to uh, start selling the drug to patients as it is. And uh, it's a bit of a gamble, but I, I think, you know, I got to give respect to the company for trying this, given that the FDA is relatively open to uh, approval of, of drugs. And we've seen this in the past couple of years since uh, Scott Got Gottlieb has been the uh, FDA guy, that they've approved a lot more uh, drugs than they have in the past. So it's, a, it's worth it to try, but I'm relatively skeptical that they're going to be able to do this. So uh, they, they're they making an argument that they have enough data to, to get accelerated approval, but uh, me and some other people are a little bit skeptical of this. So one of the things here, uh, we saw a big decrease in the stock from the beginning of the year, and uh, a lot of this is due to um, us not being sure whether or not they're going to get that accelerated approval. And if they don't, it's just going to lead to uh, a delay of sales, pretty much. But there's also a concern that there is no improvement in vaso-occlusive crises, so they might not get approval at all. So I think it was uh, early September, uh, Adam Feuerstein uh, released an article about the risks associated with um, Global Blood and their filing. And uh, it's basically due to what I'm what I'm saying here, and it's that they, they haven't been able to show an improvement in vaso-occlusive crises yet. So, you know, the FDA is not likely to, to approve it, given that so many drugs before it uh, did not show this and they weren't approved. So if we, if we go back a little bit and, you know, if you, we need to see, like, what, what did they agree upon with the FDA originally? And if we do this, you know, so I'm back here at October 24th, 2016, and what they ended up actually officially agreeing to with the FDA is two endpoints. So the primary endpoint was, you know, proportion of patients who achieve over a one gram per deciliter increase at 24 weeks of treatment. Fine. The other thing, though, is they need to have uh, met the primary endpoint and at least one key secondary endpoint. It's very clear here. Key secondary efficacy endpoints will include the effect of this is voxolator on SCD symptom exacerbation, which is going to be measured by the PRO instrument. This is their own proprietary, well, I don't know if it's, it's probably proprietary, but uh, it's their instrument for measuring vaso-occlusive crises and quality of life associated with sickle cell disease. So uh, on the clinical trial website itself, it's uh, these two different outcomes are, are, are outlined right here, proportion of days with SCD symptom exacerbation, or two, change in the SCD-SM total symptom score. And uh, all of these are due to that pro, or they're measured from that pro instrument. So if they don't get either of these, they're not going to get approval from the FDA. And that's, that's very clear here in their press release. So for people who think that there's a chance that they're going to get approval if they don't show an improvement in vaso-occlusive crises, I, I think it's misguided because they've already had this agreement with the FDA. And if they can't show it, then I, uh, I don't see a reason why the FDA would approve it. Now, the thing is, the, the data that they did release, it was preliminary data, right? So they, there's still more patients that they might be collecting data for. And uh, if they do increase the N number or they do their second part of the study, so uh, if we look here, they have part A and they have part B. But the number of patients here aren't the total number of patients necessarily yet. So if they don't see an improvement in VOCs, then, you know, I, I think the FDA is going to want them to either uh, continue with their Part B or, you know, we'll see what happens with their actual finalized data from Part A. So the things that we can look forward to, so at the uh, American Society for Hematology Conference, uh, December 3rd, they're going to show their Phase 2 data for the HOPE Kids study. Actually, I'll just pull it up here. So the HOPE Kids study is a phase two study where they're looking at this, and uh, they're also using that pro instrument to, to measure VOCs and uh, quality of life. So we'll get that data on December 2nd, and we'll also see uh, more data uh, related to the HOPE study 
and uh, and that'll be on December third. Sorry, December third uh, at Ash. So I think there we're going to get a better idea. But if they can't show an improvement in uh, VOCs, I think they're in trouble. Basically, is is my uh, conclusion from this. And uh, it's too bad that they don't give us any more details here from there. So this is the press release from the actual Hope study. You know, they don't show us like numbers. Numerically fewer doesn't really mean much. We want to know if it's significant. We want to know the magnitude. So it's a little too risky for me. So I don't think I'm going to, to take a position. But, you know, this is the uh, this is where we are for the, for the company. OK, so before we wrap up, I'm just going to give a quick portfolio update. And uh, I think the only things I really wanted to touch on was uh, so Sangamo took a big dip because they announced a delay in their hemophilia A data which is uh, disappointing, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad data. Uh, Viking continues to tumble, as well as Magical. You know, these two are almost back down to their pre-data uh, levels, their pre-data um, price levels. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm tempted to, to add more Viking here, so so we'll see. Um, Amarin had a lot of data come out on Saturday at uh, the AHA. And uh, it looked pretty good to me. I might do an entire video on uh, on Amarin. I think um, the the stock took a tumble. You know, they sold the news today. But uh, these guys have a lot of potential. I really liked what I saw. And I think a lot of the, the mineral oil in the placebo being the cause of the changes, I think it's it's really a magnitude thing. So if they hadn't used mineral oil, maybe it would have, wouldn't have been as impressive. But I think uh, the fish oil uh, is, is quite good. So... Um, otherwise, this week uh, we should see less volatility, but after this morning's open, I think that uh, the volatility has probably gone right back up. Uh, my portfolio, though, is doing a bit better than the XBI, and it's kind of on par with the S&P 500. So hopefully uh, by the end of this week, that uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep the positive energy going. But uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, again, if you like what I'm doing, please like, subscribe, or leave me a comment. And uh, let me know what you think.